How do Americans who subscribe to right-of-center politics engage with public life in a state run by the far left? Each episode will attempt to unpack this question. And, because the podcast is not for the faint-hearted, let's jump right into the deep end and talk abortion. I'm Meg Hansen, and welcome to the very first episode of Writing What's Left. Before we get into this debate, I'm sure you would like to know whether I identify as pro-choice or pro-life. To be very honest, I consider myself as both. Now that's not a cop-out, it really isn't. I've thought about this a lot, and I just don't accept the dichotomy. Let me define it further. I consider myself as pro-life, because I absolutely respect the sanctity of life. I believe that life begins at conception. I recognize fetal personhood and I do not support third term abortions. In fact, I find the concept of aborting the fetus right up till the date of delivery as absolutely appalling. New York passed legislation earlier this year legalizing that very concept, that egregious concept. And, and so in, in all these ways, I identify as pro-life. I consider myself as pro-choice because I recognize that in certain situations, it is up to the woman to decide whether she wants to carry the pregnancy to term or not. For example, in the event of rape, incest, and certain other exigent circumstances. If the fetus is diagnosed with congenital deformities or serious health complications that raise concerns about the quality of life for the baby or the parent's ability to take proper care of their child, in those instances, I truly believe that the decision lies with the woman, her husband, and their family. Now, people on the right will certainly accuse me of being morally relativist here. And perhaps that's true. After all, how can I believe in the sanctity of life and then say it is up to the woman? Because I don't see this as a black and white issue. And therefore, I do identify as both pro-choice and pro-life. But our national conversation around this issue does not entail unpacking the various shades of gray. We're not trying to understand the complexities at play. Instead, public discourse is monopolized by talking points, platitudes, and disingenuous narratives. The discussion is always framed as pitting one group against the other, pro-choice against pro-life, when in fact there's a lot of overlapping between the two groups as most Americans define them. So a survey that was conducted earlier this year showed that 66% of Americans who consider themselves as pro-choice oppose abortion in the third trimester. And this survey was taken just a few weeks after New York legalized late-term abortions. And one week after, the Virginia governor suggested that babies who do survive abortion should only be allowed to live if their mother wants them to survive. So this is where our conversation is now at. Back in the 90s, You know, a common saying was abortion should be safe, rare, and legal. That's not how the debate is framed anymore. Now when it comes to pro-choice, it means you should be okay with aborting the fetus right up to the day of delivery. And let's just say by some bizarre circumstance, the fetus survives the abortion process, then, well, there is also a good chance that then you just ignore the baby and let it die if the mother doesn't want it to live. That's where we are at in terms of the abortion debate. Against this backdrop, now let's analyze what's going on across the nation. Eight states have passed laws restricting abortion to some degree, and the idea is that at least one of them could pose a legal challenge to Roe v. Wade, and then the Supreme Court would take it up. And now that we have more conservatives on the court than leftists, perhaps Roe v. Wade could be overturned, and it would be a big win for the pro-life movement. 
two bills worth mentioning here are that of Alabama and Georgia. Alabama passed a new bill effectively outlawing abortion except in the case when the health of the pregnant mother is endangered. And so actually Alabama does not have any exceptions for rape and incest and that has got everybody in the media up in arms. I'll say this though, uh, a lot of people in the media are harping on the fact that the Alabama State Senate is comprised only of men and so they're saying look all these white men are passing laws that pertain to women's bodies. However, we never hear the fact that Roe v. Wade was decided by a Supreme Court made up entirely of men. That's right, nine men, seven of whom decided in favor of legalizing abortion. This is what I mean by disingenuous talking points that have infected public discourse around this particular issue. The second law worth mentioning is the Georgia Heartbeat Bill, which bans abortions if a heartbeat is detected, and this can be as early as six weeks. I want to mention this because CNN and ABC and a number of left-leaning outlets have covered this issue and made it a point to mention that many women do not even know that they're pregnant at six weeks. I find that a really, really, really weird statement. Well, first of all, the woman would know that she had engaged in unprotected intercourse. And at six weeks, she would have certainly missed her period. So I, I don't understand. I mean, all I can, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And I was really wondering, why, do, why are all these news outlets making it a point to editorialize and put that statement in? And I think what they're trying to do here is absolve the woman of any kind of responsibility and say, well, you've outlawed abortion after six weeks, but the woman doesn't even know that she's pregnant, so how can she go and do anything about it? You can't have your cake and eat it too. The woman either has agency or does not have agency. So which is it? Unfortunately, we can never get an honest answer because we can't engage in a transparent and truthful conversation about abortion. Why not? Well, Jordan Peterson argues that we are not mature enough as a society to confront the fact that abortion forms a surface topic for much deeper issues that lie at, at the heart of this debate, such as one, female sexuality, and this insistence that it is the same as male sexuality when we all know that it is not. Two, the relationship between sexual activity and reproduction. Three, the concept of family and its disintegration in today's times. And four, the diminished role that men play in child rearing and in the lives of their children. I am inclined to agree with Peterson's observation that the abortion issue is a proxy for deeper, more complicated issues that our society is unwilling to or hesitant to deal with. The vitriol and visceral anger that this issue sparks should also be very revealing. If abortion advocates genuinely believed that the fetus was just a part of the woman's body like her arm or a tooth or her appendix, then why would they get so charged about removing it? You know, we don't have any controversies about appendectomies or wisdom tooth removals. So why why this particular issue? It, it shows that, in fact, the people who are for abortion without any restrictions whatsoever also realize that the fetus is clearly distinct from the woman's appendix, kidney, tooth, or any other part of her body. However, they insist otherwise. That's why we have movements like Shout Your Abortion or My Body, My Choice, which advance the duplicitous, hyper-politicized, and immature rhetoric surrounding abortion. Speaking of which, let's look at the recent abortion-related bill that our brave little state of Vermont just passed as a countermeasure to states like Alabama and Georgia. House Bill 57, 
will give Vermont the most expansive abortion law in the nation. It makes abortion a, quote, fundamental right and allows the procedure to occur until the expected date of delivery for any reason whatsoever, even forbidding state agencies from interfering with access to, quote, reproductive health services. So the Republican governor, Governor Phil Scott, has decided that he will not veto the bill so he can either sign it or let it pass without signing it and then it goes into law within five days his spokeswoman said that he is pro-choice and therefore he is not going to veto it there's a lot of pressure from the abortion lobby uh, lobbyists from Planned Parenthood for example putting pressure on Phil Scott not to veto it because According to the executive director of the ACLU of Vermont, it would, quote, send the wrong message, particularly at this time in our history. Note that Vermont has absolutely no restrictions on abortion whatsoever, and this has been the status quo for decades. So H-57 doesn't change the law. All it does is position Vermont on the other side, counter to states like Alabama and Georgia as pro-choice instead of pro-life. Again, we see this war between the two supposed factions. And this particular bill is very important to me because it confirms that pro-choice now means something entirely different. Pro-choice now means that you have to be okay with aborting the fetus right up to the expected date of delivery. This means that 66% of Americans who call themselves pro-choice are no longer pro-choice. And so while I began this podcast by claiming that I am pro-choice, I guess I'm not. Pro-choice is always framed as being pro-women. And opposing abortion means that we are somehow waging an all-out war on women. But how is being okay with aborting a baby on the day of delivery, how is that a cause for women? And yet, proponents of the Vermont law claim that it is. H-57 may be a symbolic gesture, but it is a law, and laws can be changed. Therefore, the Vermont legislature has decided to step things up in the event that Roe v. Wade is overturned. What are they going to do? They are now attempting to amend our state's constitution to make abortion as an inalienable right. The proposal, known as Proposition 5, declares, quote, personal reproductive autonomy to be a fundamental right. If it passes both the state Senate and House this year, it will need to be considered again during the 2021-22 biennium. And then if it passes then, it will be presented to Vermont voters at the 2022 general election. So if Prop 5 survives this long multi-year process and succeeds in amending our state's constitution, it would mean that a radical, sweeping, no-limits right to abortion would have been created and incorporated into the constitution of our state. Which brings us to the most pertinent question of this podcast. As a Vermonter, are you okay with changing the DNA of our state to create a new right that allows an individual to end the life of a baby on the day of delivery. Some critics argue that third trimester abortions are rare and terminating a pregnancy on the day of delivery is even rarer. However, that's besides the point. As we've seen, the parameters of the pro-choice versus pro-life debate have radically shifted. Now, Proposition 5 codifies the new pro-choice argument that supports terminating the pregnancy for any reason at any time up to the date of delivery. This is the question that the people of Vermont need to grapple with. And perhaps the answer for you is yes. I imagine that those on the far left would agree with this position and want the state's constitution to reflect that. 
and it follows that Vermonters who identify as pro-life should oppose Prop 5. But what about the rest of you? Perhaps you are on the right, but don't consider yourself as conservative or pro-life. Maybe you are an independent, a centrist, left of center. Perhaps this is not an issue that you've really thought about until now. This is certainly a conversation that the people of Vermont should be having, and I hope that this podcast can provide the impetus for a truthful and transparent conversation about all things complicated. I hope you'll reach out to me with your thoughts and opinions so that we can continue the conversation in the next episode. I'm Meg Hansen, and you've been listening to Writing What's Left. 